What's up? It's episode 106, Pain Points of Wealth, and the economy is looking A-OK. We've got the market rebounding into the end of the year. We've got wages going up, unemployment still low, and inflation is coming down. Are those economists and strategists on Wall Street actually right? Are we going to fall off a cliff? Are we going to recession? Well, we're going to give you our viewpoint on that today. We're going to give you our two cents on exactly where the economy is going. And on the tipping point today, we've got a special guest. We've got Anthony O'Neill. He's a debt specialist. He's going to talk about money, his life, his relationship to money. we got a great show today. Check it out. Hit the music. Boy, Rye, you're not kidding. The market did rise sharply over the last two months. I mean, back at the beginning of October, we had a Dow that was trading around 29,000. Here we are at 34,000 uh, just two months later. You know, really, the last two months is one of the best years I've ever had in my portfolio, right? You had international up almost 20%. You have large cap value is up for the year. Uh, November alone was one of the best months ever you know, for municipal bond prices since 1986. Yeah, and what I love the most is just watching these economists and these strategists backtrack, right? They've been so negative all year. When the market's going down, they sound so smart. But all of a sudden, as the market starts to rebound, and they're like, whoa, 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 you know, I know the employment number's strong and people's wages are going up, but that's going to be a bad thing. Like, why is that ever a bad thing when people's wages are going up and unemployment is low. That's never a bad thing, by the way. And I mean, I'm not an economist, but like, come on, give me a break. Well, it's just so hard to be an investor, guys. You go back to 2008 when we started paying capital management. Of course, you know, I started in 1975, so I did a lot of other things in between. But, you know, from 2008, we believed it was one of the greatest bull markets in history. We were right on the doorstep of it. Everybody was pretty negative, especially in the U.S. market. You know, now it's gone full circle. Now everybody's real positive in the U.S. market and real negative in the international market. They don't see the opportunity, but it's like smacking you right in the face. I mean, who doesn't know that Taiwan could be invaded by China, right? Who doesn't know, Chris, that the U.S. dollar has hurt non-U.S. assets? Who doesn't know that there's an energy crisis in Europe? Meanwhile, most of the world doesn't know right now that the U.K., right, the British market, their stock market, the FTSE, is outperforming the S&P and the Dow and the NASDAQ. Yeah, it's kind of wild to think that England has actually gone positive for the year because, I mean, you look at the headlines, right, and they're just political systems a mess. They've got higher inflation than we do. But it kind of goes back to what you just said, Bob. I mean, if we all know it, it's already priced into that market. So it's kind of like, well, it doesn't look good in Europe. Well, yeah, we know. It, you know, But the market's already accounted for that. But I think it also speaks to my favorite Bobism, or one of my favorite Bobisms, because there's so many. Don't invest in the market you want, invest in the market you have. And the reality of it is, if you look at like technology, you look at communication services, and you look at consumer discretionary, which are the big, big weightings in the S&P 500, that's all your mega cap stocks. That's done horrible this year, yet you look at financials, energy, consumer staples, and that's what Europe has a lot of. That's what's been really, really strong. And you know, you got to start thinking about the future, and you have to start thinking about putting your money in other places because you can't just keep doubling down on what was great the last 10 years. It's not going to be great the next 10 years, most likely, and that's something we've kind of preached on this show week after week. Yeah, another one of my favorite Bobisms is that past performance is 100% indicative of past performance. It actually has no predictive power whatsoever, but everybody feels more confident when they're investing in something that's done well for a while. And that's why... You know, in the U.S. market, specifically in the S&P 500, or more importantly, the growth segment of the S&P 500, you know, 48 percent, almost half of it is in communications, technology, you know, consumer discretionary. Um, you don't have that in Europe. It's only 10 percent. Uh, so it's like when you start to look at where the opportunities are, you got to remember more is better than less, right? It's better to get a 4 percent dividend than a 2 percent dividend, which is what you're able to get in non-U.S. assets. But also, less is better than more, right? You're able to buy and invest in companies that are selling at 10 to 11 times future earnings as opposed to 17 to 18 times future earnings. In other words, it's better to buy when things are at a discount. Wow. Summed it up, Chris. Keep it simple, man. I like that. You know what, Chris? Mom would be very proud of you. Yeah, that's because she's, she's all about bargains. No, it's all about getting those coupons and buying some great companies. Well, and that's going to be a big mistake investors are going to make here. They're not going to buy the international markets because they've been horrible for so long. And China is a perfect example. 
right? I mean, everyone gave up on China, and China's had a huge rebound here, even with the protests going on over there. Um, and that's, you know, just says that all the news is kind of priced in here. I mean, every day you heard about China having protests against the COVID lockdowns, the market went higher, right? It sounds counterintuitive. But, you know, the reality of it is, and I've heard this before too, like, oh, China, it's uninvestable. Every U.S. company is in China doing business. <laughs> so that's pretty investable from where we're standing. I mean, it's just a complete fallacy. And it's just because that market's done so poorly for so long, you come, you come up with excuses. But at the end of the day, like, we know it's the second largest economy of the world. We know that the largest populations are outside the U.S. and they're growing. And we know that growth is faster outside the U.S. Eventually, the market's going to catch up to that. And right now, it's still trading at a discount. So you have this huge arbitrage. So you've really got to spread that money out. You can't just be U.S. centric and you can't just buy the winners of the last 10 years. We've seen this mistake over and over again, and every investor is making it right now. Well, you know, guys, every central bank in the world is tightening right now, except for China. They're stimulating their economy. I mean, it's the exact opposite. And you have these talking heads telling us every day it's uninvestable. Yeah, sure. When's it going to be investable after it's up 40 percent? Because they already missed the 20 percent move. Well, it just goes to show you people don't like a discount when it comes to the stock market. It's like they do the exact opposite. It's like, oh, you know what? I don't like Apple at 50 bucks a share. I'm going to wait till it goes to 1,000. Well, you know what, Chris? It's just the way the whole market works, right? That You have the Federal Reserve just came out and raised interest rates 75 basis points. Jerome Powell was on the other day saying, it looks like we're going to have a 50 basis point increase at the December meeting. Um, meanwhile, the bond market's rallying, right? So I have clients calling me saying, Bob, how, how is it possible that our bond portfolio is going up, that the 10-year Treasury yield is dropping? It's down to where it was this past summer when the Fed has tightened something like 300 basis points. Again, the market's forward-looking. It's, it's already you know, looking past what they're doing today. That was priced in this summer. And that's the hardest part about investing. You know, you've got to be able to look forward like the market does. And if you don't, you're, you're going to be a pretty poor investor. You know what, Dad? I don't know about that. I actually uh, heard through the grapevine that Jerome Powell finally got smart and started listening to our podcast. Hey, listen, buddy. He's been listening all along, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it wasn't his fault. It was that other gang at 12, you know, those other Federal Reserve governors that wouldn't allow him to get hawkish when he was supposed to and get dovish when he, like he needs to be now. Who knows, right? Who knows? I mean, who knows with the Fed and who knows? Again, like I think he said this last week on the podcast, but they're probably winging it anyway. But you know, what blows my mind is the numbers in plain sight have been so good, yet everyone needs to spin it negatively. Like, like if you look at the holiday sales so far, right? We have a Black Friday. You look at Cyber Monday. We had records on both days. And all I've been hearing for the last couple of weeks is, this is where we're going to find out the consumer finally has a problem. They're not going to keep spending. And of course, you're seeing the exact opposite. You know why you're seeing the exact opposite? Because you've seen the exact opposite all year, right? Spending has stayed strong even when inflation was over 8%. Why is that going to change now? And it's just like, it, it blows my mind the way these, these Wall Street analysts just like can't believe it, right? And they, they're looking for ways to rationalize. Well, well, it can't be good that we just added another 200,000 jobs uh, because, look, they're laying off in tech over here. But, you know, meanwhile, there's other sectors in the economy. Tech is not the only sector in the U.S. economy. Um, and I think the media really skews it and they give us this negative perception and it's just not true. And I think it really, really doesn't benefit your ability to invest because it makes you feel very skittish when you should be embracing the fact that the news is actually pretty good. Well, that's why you have to be an investor as opposed to a trader. You listen to these pundits and they're telling you about how we're going to have a hard landing. And some pundits say we're going to have a soft landing. Well, you know what a lot of you don't factor in is how about we don't have any landing, right? We don't go into a recession, even a rolling recession. And the economy just continues to roll on. So it, it's, you know, so what if you're right or wrong about that? You know, it's if you're not invested, you don't, you don't take advantage of the opportunities. Nobody rings the bell. Nobody waves a flag. Nobody tells you exactly when the right time is. And, you know, you should have been buying, you know, longer term bonds a month ago, two months ago, three months ago. Um, you know, you, if you wait until you're certain, you've already missed the opportunity. And you know what, guys? Investing is about taking advantage of opportunity. And when opportunity knocks... I answer the door. What's up? It's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P A Y N E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. We got a very special guest on the show today. We got Anthony O'Neill. He's a debt specialist, huge influencer online. Uh, he's got some great content out there. We put all his links. You can check them out, uh, check more about 
Anthony what he does. And Anthony, thanks for coming on the show today, man. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. No, Ryan, man, thank you so much for having me on. And excited to be with you, Bob and uh, Chris, and just really have a good, honest, transparent conversation around money and debt. So thanks again for having me on. Hey, my pleasure, man. And I, you know, I wish I was in Miami too, or Naples with Bob. You guys <laughs> <aren't> right. <laughs> Chris and I over here, we're suffering in the Northeast, but you guys, I man, you can tell, you know, you guys look a little more relaxed, a little more chill. Listen, man, God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anthony, I, mean, I guess a good place to start is like, yeah, hey, yeah, where'd you grow up? You know, what was your relationship with money growing up? And, you know, how do you think that's kind of formed the way you view money now? And obviously, you know, you talk a lot about debt and how to get out of debt. Like, you know, what really formed your opinions about money and your feelings and emotions around money? Man, that's such a good question, man. You know, one of the things that I tell everyone is I had the opportunity to grow up with like four loving parents. So I had two, bio I have two biological fathers and two step, not two, yeah, and two step parents. No, I'm wrong. I have two biological parents and two step parents. Um, and I really, don't, I don't really like the term step parents because they love me like they're their own and uh, they raised me like their own. And so I have four loving parents, but I come from a very strong Christian faith, Church of God in Christ background, right? So this means when I was growing up, if it wasn't attached to the spiritual component of life, then I couldn't do it. So there was no school dances. There was no basketball, football games on Friday nights. Wow. It was, hey, go to school, get your grades done, come home, get your homework done, and we're going to church. And the only thing that they taught me when it came to money from a spiritual perspective was give 10% of your money to church and then do whatever else you want to do with the 90%, pay your bills, da, 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 da. So graduating high school, I graduated with really no practical steps on how to be successful financially. All I remember was go to church every Sunday, go to church every Wednesday, whenever you get paid, give, give you know 10% uh, to your local church. And so when I graduated high school, I was like, I'm free. I'm like, oh, I'm a free man. I don't have to go to church anymore. <laughs> I don't have to, you know, uh, give 10% to the church, to the pastor that I don't even know. I don't even like like that. So I started balling out. I just started going crazy um, with my money when I had money. I went off to college. Man, I was taking out a whole bunch of student loans when I didn't need it because I had my father's GI Bill from the Army. So school was paid for I um, I had a job that was taking care of some things. Um, and so I just really realized that I was like, man, I'll never forget when they offered me my very first credit card. And I'll make it the story short from here so you all can understand the background of money. They offered me that very first credit card and pulled me in because they offered me two free large pieces and a free T-shirt. And just to sign up for the credit card. And I was like, yo, bet. I wasn't even thinking about the credit card. I was thinking about the free food because I was I was not broke but I was I wasn't making a lot of money so I was like let me get this piece of but that was the most expensive piece I ever paid for in my entire life because that five hundred dollar credit card after late fees uh charge offs and everything like that turned into about sixteen hundred dollars in a matter of six months of me graduating high school you know I'm about thirty five thousand dollars in debt getting bill collectors calling my mom and dad looking for me wow um I made a bad decision in school that unfortunately cost me my, my school experience since by the age of 19 um, you know, I was homeless, sleeping in the back of my car with $35,000 in debt. And it was really because I didn't really have the foundation of finances. I had the foundation of a spiritual walk. I had a foundation of great parents. And to be honest, they, they taught me what they were taught. But no one taught me how to be an entrepreneur. No one taught me how to build wealth. No one even taught me, hey, listen, if you're going to get a credit card, here's the best way to manage the credit card. Um, no one taught me information. No, it's true. I mean, it's like, and I know, I remember from my college days too, like there's, it's like kind of predatory the way they, they get on the campus, you know, and it's always like they got balloons out there. And like to your point, I mean, come on, when you're 19, 20, who doesn't want a free piece of pizza? Um, you know, it's actually funny when we even do our 401k meetings now for, to get people to come to the meeting, you just say free pizza, everyone shows up. <laughs> so it's, it's un unbelievable like, what that can do. Um, and obviously church bingo just wasn't enough to satisfy uh, <laughs> whatever desires you had at that age. But yeah, it's a, it's a big problem in this country, and you're seeing that a lot now too with a lot of these like uh, pay late, buy now, pay later. And you know, with a lot of the, the penalties, not paying, a lot of these young people get sucked into uh, a lot of these. I don't want to say schemes, but you know, it's it, they sound like they give you a low financing rate, but you know, a lot of these people aren't going to pay it back, and then they're just going to get further and further behind the eight ball, which sucks when you're young. It really does suck when you're young. You know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of no debt, right? And so, and I'm a huge proponent of like, hey, before you even consider 
um, um, let's say if you are going to have a credit card with my new philosophy, it's like, hey, I'm not a huge fan of debt, but I'm like, hey, at least be out of debt for at least two to three years before you even do that. So that way you can live, you know, you can live without even borrowing any kind of money. And when you look at these buy here, pay later uh, programs, Klarna and stuff like that, they're real smart. It's like, hey, why don't you just finance this $5 shirt? Because they know, well, if I could finance a $5 shirt, then I can finance five five dollar shirts and so when you went there to buy one shirt now you got five shirts that you really don't need you really can't afford because my thing is if you can't afford to pay for your shirt a pair of jeans then you shouldn't be shopping at all but Klarna is smart these buy here pay later programs are smart like hey let's go ahead and get them in debt because we'll know they'll keep coming back they'll keep coming back they may get that one person to only buy one thing for 10 bucks but they'll come back next month you know what i can do 100 bucks then they'll come at the next time. I can do a thousand dollars. Now we're in a system that is setting us up to fail long term rather than just living below our means and sticking to our budget. So um, I'm a huge proponent of, of, of uh, be debt free. That's what I'm currently am. I'm, I'm debt free, uh, but I'm trying to educate everyone in every season of their life. I mean, that's kind of my, my pet peeve when it comes to universities. They they allow these credit card companies to come on campus and, and shop their wares and sell their wares. But meanwhile, they don't have any basic financial education for the average student. It's not unusual for a student to get out of uh, the graduate school with a PhD and have credit card debt not understanding that that interest rate is not deductible, that it's compounding against them, um, and, and you know not even know how to balance a checkbook. I just don't understand why our education system and this is an indictment against the whole education system, you know, they, they don't teach basic finance, basic balancing, you know, like how to balance a checkbook, how to handle money. It's like, it's almost like it's voodoo uh, when it comes to universities or schools. You know, Bob, that's so true, man. It's 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 sad and it's disappointing. And I 100% I echo what you're saying. It's not just even our universities, it's the entire education system. Because when we look at the education system, what is it there for? It's there to teach us. It's there to teach us how to read, write, process information, and add, so that one day that we can go get a job and contribute to the economy. But the problem is, you're teaching me how to get a job, but you're not teaching me how to be a good steward over the resources that, that job will bring me. And so it's like you're teaching me go out there, get a job, work, 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 but you're not teaching me how to how to really survive and live. And so the education system has to step up on that plate. I know they got programs out there like Dave Ramsey's school program is, is in the schools, uh, but it should be a requirement, I believe, um, starting as early as in middle school all the way through college. And speaking of education, Anthony, I mean, what were the steps that you took to get out of debt? How, what was that process like? I mean, you know, the very first thing that I did, I, I started researching a lot of things. You know, you have Robert Kiyosaki out there. Um, uh, Grant Cardone has started just booming up. And then, you know, you had Dave Ramsey with Financial Peace University. And because I, I am spiritual, right, one of the things that really resonated with me was Financial Peace University, Dave Ramsey's program. And so I said, you know what, let me let me check that out. Um, it was hard, I'll be honest, because when you have a guy like Dave calling you stupid and crazy for having a credit card, I really couldn't listen to him at the time, but I grew to love the guy uh, because his principles worked. And so that's exactly what I did. I followed his seven baby steps uh, to get out of debt um, and still believe in practice those teachings today, right? Uh, but I just really focused. I started educating myself mentally on, okay, who am I? Uh, where where do I want to be and how am I going to get there? And so I had to really discover I want to be debt free. Then I had to create a plan that was going to allow me to be debt free. And I took on a financial peace university plan of seven baby steps. And then I'm now I'm in a season of maintaining that, you know, so I'm staying true to the foundations and I'm maintaining that. But I think the very first step everyone has to do is really define what do you want to do? Do you want to be debt free? If you want to be debt free, Go find a plan that it is a proven plan that will help you get out of debt. I mean, then once you find that plan, you stick to that plan uh, for the remaining part of the process while you're getting out of debt or while you're building wealth. Right now, I'm in the whole process of wealth building, which is why I love y'all show, because I'm always now I'm listening to I'm out of debt. How do I continue building wealth? So I'm continuing to get that information and listening. Well, that's interesting, too, because I mean, we're obviously on the wealth creation stage for people or preserving wealth is a big part of it, too, because a lot of times maybe our client had a big liquidity event. They sold their business. You know, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And what blows our mind is how uneducated people are about investing. And, you know, the crazy thing about investing is it's not rocket science. Um, but, you know, you get out there now with the proliferation of like YouTube channels, Instagram, these influencers that give 
uh, horrible advice about investing. Um, you, you were seeing this with the whole crypto thing, which, you know, for us, we've been doing this so long, it was kind of like not if crypto blows up, it's just when, you know, these cycles are over and over again. Um, it's kind of a dangerous time because I think there's so many people out there that don't have a background in investing, giving a lot of free advice on the internet. And you got a lot of people following that advice and you're seeing it right now where, where people are literally, you know, getting destroyed because, you know, they're, they're getting led the wrong way. I mean, how has someone now you're on the wealth building stage, you get out of debt, like, you know, what's been the process for you? Like to kind of like get educated correctly on these things. I mean, you know, I got slammed so much because I told people uh, investing in a cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is not a wealth proven strategy. They <laughs> called me crazy. <laughs> they was like, oh my gosh. Us too. <laughs> How could it not work? Right, you know what I'm saying? Just, they have big conferences in Miami. Yeah, <laughs> big conferences in Miami. You know, I was like- real. Right, you know, must be real. The name is on the uh, is on <laughs> arenas, you know? it's like. They, but that name is now let's be real the name is no longer on the arena and so i think for me it's what i tell people when it comes to wealth building i have a smoker mindset when i say smoker i'm not talking about smoking i'm talking about the, the smoker that you put your food in that cooks it very slowly and gradually right and so my thing always goes back to if you have a job you got to take advance you got to take up advantage of your 401 clay pans and your your matches um if you don't have a job you got to take advantage of your mutual funds your roth iras your traditional iras um you got to take advantage of me even right now now, I'm looking more so into how do I invest into land? How do I invest into real estate? Because we have uh, the capabilities of building real estate, but we don't have the capability of building land anymore. And so I've been purchasing land because I want that to grow and to evolve because one day someone's going to want to rent it from me or they're going to want to buy it from me and I can flip the land. And also, too, the number one investment when it comes to building wealth I've learned is once you cover your basics, like take, do the basics in the stock market, do the basics into real estate, you're your number one investment. So I've stepped back and said, OK, cool, great. How can I grow Anthony O'Neill? and produce income from the education that I've learned. Um, but then also watch this. It's not education that I've learned from YouTubers who call themselves experts. This is education that I've learned, that I've studied, that I've personally applied, then I can come out and, and give off as a suggestion. You know, y'all are experts in the field. Dave Rams is an expert in the field, right? And everyone says Anthony is an expert. No, I'm a student who's just teaching what I've learned. I've never give I've never given any advice financially that I, I felt like, uh, no, I don't give uh, strategic investment advice. I say, hey, listen, this is what I've done, but this is what I can do. I can connect you with a financial advisor um, who can really walk you through the steps on how to do exactly what's best for you. But this is what I've done. So I call myself the student who's just teaching what I'm learning and I'm connecting them with pros who are the licensed, educated, degreed individuals in that space. So that way they can get the proper information. And so does Dave. You know, he doesn't even have a degree in financial education. I know a lot of people don't, but um, you're, you're right. A lot of these TikTokers are, are going and say, man, you got to do this. If you want to make a million dollars in 24, 24 hours, you got to do this. And I'm like, these are the dumbest people on the planet <laughs> Earth. Because it's like what they're doing is I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it probably happened for one person. And because one person won with the crypto, now everyone wants to do it. And I'm like, no, if you look at the proven steps, right, if you really invest into the stock market, invest into a, a mutual fund, you know, you can see that there is evidence that people have built wealth that way. You know, you can see that there there's evidence that you got people saying you can get rich and become a billionaire off of certain insurance plans. I'm like, you guys, come, what, 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 what are you come doing? Earth. Yeah. So it's like for me, I follow the basic stuff, man. And I think when it comes to really building wealth, I sit down and I'm very strategic with, OK, what can I bring to this earth uh, that is missing? You know, what can I bring to the conversation that is missing? I mean, that's been one of my number one tools of growing the wealth that we've built today. Yeah, you bring up a good point, too. And I think that's it's there. You, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme, we like to say. And, yeah, there is a track record there, right? If someone has a track record, that's just a huge plus because it's already been done before. And that's where, you know, going back to kind of like crypto, it's kind of like we've already seen that before when the housing bubble burst uh, just 10 years ago and, you know, 20 years ago when the tech bubble burst. And it's so funny because it's so similar yet people just can't see the similarities yet it's almost like it's almost like literally watching the same movie over and over again and, and like to your point if someone has experience 
and they've been through these things and you know they do have a track record like there are higher odds that they're gonna have success in the future than some quote unquote new new thing that you have to get into but the allure of that is just so so great you know and it's just amazing how people just over and over again it's just human nature repeating itself with the same like oscillating between what we call like fear and greed as well as how markets move but uh, but you're right it really is you can you can kind of look and see in the past and you can see what's proven and not proven right you don't need to reinvent the wheel i guess what i'm trying to say no i mean i think when people try to reinvent the wheel um they're, they're trying to do something that I, I believe is a little dangerous my thing is what's what's already out there what can I bring to this conversation that is missing? And I think there's a lot of places out there that are missing healthy, solid uh, messages that you could bring to the conversation that's gonna really help uh, someone. And so I'm not looking for nothing new. I just wanna do what I've been called to do and help and serve people. Well, you know, you uh, you made you made a good point earlier. You talked about, you know, getting out of debt. Uh, and the one thing you said that really I thought was interesting, you said you got to have a goal. And we have the same philosophy here at Payne Capital Management. We have what's called the A to B process where we start, at, we start at B. What's the financial goal? What are you trying to reach? And I think, you know, the point Ryan made, the point you made about, you know, what's this new hot thing? You know, get, get, which, get rich quick schemes, you know, are so attractive because they seem easy. But the reality is it's like goal-based investing or, you know, setting a goal to get out of, get out of debt. You know, you got to have that discipline. It's going to take a little bit of time. You know, and I think I think that's you know what you're preaching there is pretty good. God, uh, no, man, I, I I believe that if you aim at nothing, you'll hit that all the time. And I believe that the caliber of your future will be determined by the caliber of goals and decisions that you make today. And so, if you want your future to be bright, if you want your future to be wealthy and solid and fruitful and joyful, then you got to make fruitful and joyful goals and decisions today. And that's just very important. You know, when I branched out on my own about a two years ago now, I said, hey, what, what, where am I going? What do I want to accomplish? And my very first thing is I want to be intentional. I want to be impactful and I want to be influential. And those three things will produce then income. And so that's the main thing is like, hey, are my goals intentional? Are my goals, if I accomplish them, will they be impactful to others? Will it be influential? And if the answer is yes to all three of those, then income will come. And so you, you can't go there with you can't go nowhere without goals, without a vision and really more so vision than goals. When you really think about it, because goals means that once you hit that goal, it comes to a stop. So I, I love goals, but I also me personally, I want a vision that is ongoing, that is never going to stop. I'm going to keep going I'm as long as I'm living on this earth. So. You know, you're right, Chris. We got to have some some solid intentional goals in place so we can make some some strong impact. You know, Anthony, that's a great message, and it's uh, it's kind of like football, right? I, I I'm I'm really excited this year. Philadelphia Eagles are doing really well, but uh, you know, it's boring if they're just you know getting a couple of yards and and they make a first down. That's how you win. But and if it comes down to what really people want to see is a hell mary pass. Yes. But if you're throwing a hell mary pass, then your team's in trouble. Um, so if your investing strategy is, I got to throw a Hail Mary, uh, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. So I think your message of you got to be a good steward of your capital, especially your human capital, which I think is a great message. You're spot on. And, and, and you may not be a teacher and you say you're a student. I'll tell you what, I'm giving you a gold star. I, I think you've, uh, you've done really well. I think your message is phenomenal. I appreciate that, Bob. I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that, uh, football analogy. Cause you're right. I just took my dad to the, um, uh, the Eagles, he's a, um, no, not Eagles, he's a Vikings fan. And they were throwing Hail Marys often. <laughs> and my dad said, we're in trouble. If, if we're, <laughs> he said, because if we're not, why are we not letting him run the play? Like, how come he's not running the ball? Like, And I was like, wait, what do you mean? So I follow basketball more than football. My dad was like, if we're always throwing it like that, that means something's wrong. And when you just said that, it clicked in my head and you're right. It's like, man, if you got to. If you got to throw Hail Marys all the time, invest in the crypto, that means something's wrong on your end. So I like that. Anthony, you probably don't know this, but uh, you experienced, you witnessed something incredible today. Anything that Bob says that's that's epic, we call it a Bobism. No. You just you just experienced a brand new Bobism. If you're throwing a Hail Mary pass, you might be in trouble. Yo, I like that Bobism. I like that. Bob. So you heard it here first. Yo, listen, y'all, it's going to be called an AOism here in a little bit. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> great art of steel anthony great art hey of steel. listen and it's copy it's, it's okay to copy the cat just copy the right cat and i'm copying bob the cat for so <laughs> <laughs> bob the cat i like that that could be a new 
I don't know, man. There must have been some pretty charismatic preachers in those churches, man, because I don't know. You picked it up. For somewhere in there, you, you're getting something from those uh, those weekly church visits. So I sure did. I got something from it. I'm just adding more flavor to it now, you know, because they didn't really teach us how to do money. And we're, we're within my culture, man, we're really trying to do that. That is something that we got to get better at on really teaching true stewardship and true wealth building. You know, that's something important. Although I tell you, some of these preachers really have it made. Is that that guy down in uh, Texas? I think he's got his own airport at his in his uh, priory. I don't know who you're talking about. I would love to know who that is. Uh, uh, Ken, Kenneth something. Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland. Yep, he's got an air, airport on his property. His, pro his quote unquote priory. So he's he's done well with the money. Yeah, he's done well. And there's a lot of preachers who have done well. I just and I don't want to knock on no preachers, but I mean, I say I think I have no problem with preachers doing well. But are you teaching your members? your your followers how to do well as well and i believe that the first assignment is when it comes to the church we shouldn't teach them how to give to the church first we should teach them how to take care of their homes first and the fruit of their homes flow into the actual church building so some may hate me for saying that but you know that's just where i stand though you know let's, let's teach them how to be good stewards of their home because that's that's my number one that's my number one assignment is my home and then from there I want to be a giver uh, to to my local church. Maybe that's why Chris has a gold Rolls Royce. I was wondering. Maybe he's just been knocking away. And, uh -huh. Ryan, I took care of my home first. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, man, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, it just beautifully said. And uh, if you want to check out any of your any of your stuff online, we're going to put all the links below for Anthony O'Neill. Check out his, his Instagram is amazing. Um, you have some really great content up there, so we'll put all the, all the information in there. Uh, this has just been a cool conversation and just love your perspective on, you know, your view with money, uh, debt and, and building wealth. I mean, it's, it's all about financial independence at the end of the day. That's one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves in my opinion. Yeah, man. Appreciate y'all for having me on and I need to turn around and get y'all on my show to have a real conversation over there too. So we're going to make that happen here in the Q1 of uh, next year. So appreciate y'all. We're always ready. Thanks, Anthony. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 106, Pain Points of Wealth. Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is literally what we do every single day. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars and you want a more hands-on approach to your finances and you want to get a full review, if you qualify, Bob, Chris, and I will put together our total financial master plan. We'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review where we look at everything. We look at every investment that you own. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal and we'll get hone in on every financial issue you have to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement, taking Social Security, how do you build your wealth, a savings and expense plan to make sure that you're on track with all your goals. We're going to look at taxes. Money saved in taxes is just as green as any money you can make. We're going to look at fees. We're going to go through every investment that you own to make sure you're not being overcharged. And we'll put it together into one total financial master plan to make sure you're on track for all your financial independence goals. Simply go to www paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, Apple has outperformed its peers by a wide margin this year. Microsoft is off 31%. Alphabet's down 35%. Amazon down 43%. Meta or Facebook has plunged 67%. Apple is now worth more than Microsoft and Meta put together combined. So, Rod, what you're telling me, you should have bought Apple, not the other ones? Is that what you're telling me? It's funny because I totally predicted that at the beginning of the year. Remember I told you guys? <laughs> like, guys, I have... Just have this feeling this year that you should only own Apple. So, good thing my gut feeling is always right. Well, you know, over the last um, five years... Uh, just about any, any conversation you would have with someone uh, about the market. So they'd say, well, I'm just going to add more money to my, my Facebook and my Amazon and my Google holdings, uh, which is now Alphabet. But it's just, uh, you know, investing is not that simple. And every cycle is the same. You know, we, I went through that with GE back in the 80s and the 90s. It was all I have to do is add money to Intel uh, or Cisco. Um, and you know, valuations matter when you're selling at 89 times earnings like Amazon is right now. It's not a bargain guys. No, that's a remarkable thing. I mean, it's come down so much, but the valuation is still so high and that's your biggest risk, right? 
these stocks could do nothing for a long time. We've seen it before. Could happen again. Well, it just goes to show you that a lot of investors, they invest in the story. They don't invest in the company. You got to you got to pay attention to company fundamentals. It's, it's that simple. Chris, there have been around 33,000 tech layoffs since the beginning of November. However, the economy has generated something like 261,000 jobs in October, 200,000 jobs in November. Simple math, more jobs are being created than are being lost. This doesn't sound very recessionary to me. Well, it just goes to show your eye. Once again, just like all things in the market, uh, the media is focused on all the wrong things. Um, the economy's in good shape. We've got a strong labor force. Um, if I were you, I would invest in what the opposite the media says. There you go, Chris. I like the counter trend. Bob, 10,000 baby boomers reach age 65 every day, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. And by 2030, all baby boomers will be at least 65. The boomer labor force has been declining by 2.2 million on average each year since 2010, or about 5,900 people daily are leaving the workforce. I think this is a problem, Bob. You know, right, it's a big problem. And the economists are focused on it, and they're talking about it every day. There's a shortage of workers. And as the baby boomers get older, they're retiring. Not every baby boomer's retiring. Here's one that's sitting here right now, working hard every day, unlike you guys. Um, but, uh, you know, i got to set an example for my kids. What can I tell you? But, you know, when you look at what's happening with the employment uh, reports, you know, we have two openings for every person seeking a job. And meanwhile, the boomers are going to keep retiring. It's a problem. It's not a problem just for our country. It's a problem for every country in the world. You know, that, that hardest working baby boomer, I didn't see mom in the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. The U.S. just passed one trillion music streams this year. The first time that milestone had been reached in a single year, that's about 960,000 years of streaming music so far in 2022. Man, that trend's taken off. Wow, that's a lot of music, Ryan. You know, it's really interesting because, you know, human beings have only been on planet Earth for two million years. So basically half of humanity could, be, could have spent listening to all the great music that's been put out. It's pretty deep, Chris. I'm going to think about that one for a very, very long time. <laughs> at least 960,000 years. Well, this is another great show. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes. Leave us a five-star rating if you would. Spotify, you can subscribe. If this is on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. Subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell so you can be updated every week of all our new podcasts. Your support gives us the ability to keep doing this podcast. And if you have a question, you want us to answer it, Go to bebullish.com slash questions. We'll answer all your questions either directly or on this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.